To that end, we're going to talk about key features that we're uh, getting with 10.1. We'll talk about minimizing risk, we'll talk about the landscape design, which really feeds into the migration discussion. And then finally, we'll talk just high level about building a business case, obviously. Everyone's different. Uh, we're not going to be able to get the dollars and cents, but hopefully give you the, the key bullet points that you can quantify for your specific uh, organization to help build that business case. And of course, we'll open it up to questions, save some time towards the end. So I encourage you to ask questions as we go along. Um, even if they're not necessarily related to the migration, you know, feel free to ask. We'll try to get to them today. If we don't get to them today, we'll definitely follow up after the webinar is completed. So with that, let's go ahead and move on to feature enhancements with 10.1. Um, now one of the first things that happens when you talk to, uh, when you start having your GRC access control versa discussion, is you always get stopped up or you, there's always problems with semantics and terminology. So I wanted to throw this slide out there. Um, you know, the uh, no offense, Jennifer, but the folks at uh, SAP Marketing feel like they're adding a lot of value every time they're releasing a new version and rebranding everything, which does cause confusion. So this is a kind of a cheat sheet you guys can screenshot as we go along. I'm going to try to stick with the access control terminology. Uh, just know that if I'm saying ARA and you're used to saying RAR, compliance calibrator, those are the same things, and then emergency access management. Uh, just think firefighter if you're still stuck in the 5.3 the terminology or super user privilege. So now that we're on the same page from a terminology perspective, let's talk about feature enhancements. What do you get when you upgrade to 10 .1? If you haven't seen this, um, you know, we do have a demo or a lab environment that you guys can take a look at if you want to dig more into the details. Um, but I'm highlighting the key feature enhancements here uh, with 10.1. So there's four, I, I, you know, there's a lot of uh, feature enhancements. I've kind of categorized them into four specific areas. One is a simplified user experience. Uh, the SAP term for this is harmonization. Um, so they've really spent a lot of time getting these four modules integrated into one platform. If you are a 5.3 customer, you're used to going to RAR, your RAR URL to do your reporting, and then you go to your CUP URL to do your user provisioning. Um, that kind of goes away with 10.1. All those applications are integrated, and you don't have a configuration tab in your RAR URL, and then another configuration tab to deal with when you're dealing with CUP. Um, all of your setup is in one tab and one UR, uh, user interface. So a lot easier and simpler to navigate around. Um, they've also spent a lot of time um, on reports and getting reports to users that are actionable and usable. And we'll talk about a couple of specific examples. Um, basically, in 5.3 where you would re review a report and then that might potentially kick off a follow-up activity, the focus on 10.1, they've really spent a lot of time getting you actionable information that you can make decisions on on that first report. And I'm actually going to jump to the next slide just to show you a quick example. Um, for those of you who do a lot of Sarbanes-Oxley based reporting and are relying on this to address separation of duties, this is a Excel dump of an ARA report, separation of duties report. And uh, this is a one specific user, one specific risk. You can see the second column there is F028. They can do AP and GL, uh, make GL postings and in, enter AP invoices, and that's a medium risk in this case. Um, but if we're looking to mitigate this risk, um, we, you know, we, there's several types of analysis that you can do. Do we put a mitigating control in here? Can we remove this access? Um, in this particular case, that second to last column is your executions of the transaction. So you can see here uh, that for each specific rule that was triggered to identify this as a risk for this user, we can see that, um, for example, in the, the very top two conflicting T codes, FBB0 was executed 11 times in the reporting period, and, and this GL post entry F03 was not executed at all. Um, and we just keep going down the list. They didn't do any mass reversals, so on and so forth. So really, we, with the initial 
detail report that we get out of GRC 10.1, we, we have actionable data that we can act on. And I've been in conversations with internal audit folks um, walking through these reports, and we've been able to just kick off tickets. You know, I open a ticket right now to remove that GL recurring documents role from uh, Richard Allen's access. Um, so just, they've spent a lot of time, this is just one example, they spent a lot of time combining these reports. And we'll talk about another one um, when we talk about firefighter reporting. Let's go ahead and jump back to uh, our key feature enhancements. Um, so along with that harmonization, uh, again, the harmonization, the SAP marketing term, there's been a lot of time spent on integrating not just the modules within Access Control slash GRC. There's been a lot of time and effort spent integrating that with the GR other applications within the GRC suite, for example, process control and risk management. There's also been a lot of time spent integrating that with IDM. So if you have gone down the path of, of using IDM to replace your CUA, uh, which is no longer supported by SAP, um, you can integrate IDM into your request provisioning process. So at the end of the day, you can go through your risk analysis and your approvals on the access control side. That'll trigger an, a provisioning activity on the identity management side. Um, and that's relatively easy. To, it's, that's handled with configuration and not custom development. So that's another key feature benefit. Um, there's been a lot of time spent on access request management. This is where a lot of an organization's time is spent in users requesting access, approvers approving access. And they spend a lot of time streamlining this process. It still has that SAP GUI look and feel, and there's some training that's involved, but it's a lot simpler with 10.1. There's also this concept for templates. So you can have, if you have common types of requests, and an example here would be if you have ESS users, a lot of your SAP users are ESS users, and um, you know, there's really not a lot of thought that goes into them. It's just time and effort to provision those users. Um, you can create a template request for ESS users that really doesn't, you don't have to figure out what roles correspond to the ESS user access. It's just all uh, pre-filled out for you. So it's, it's you know, like a two or three click process. Um, and you also have online password reset functionality in, in the new ARM which is uh, another key area where a lot of organizations spend time on password resets. Um, and then uh, you also have support now for Fiori, which you didn't have with 5.3. So the mobile device support, again, the, the, the theory being you've got the critical decision makers in meetings all day. They're able to view the access requests as they come through and, and have actionable data that they can either reject or approve those requests. Um, Moving on to really bullet point two now, um, one of the key benefits, and it doesn't seem like a big one right away. Um, I'm kind of a I'm, I'm a, I'm one of those SAP practitioners who's familiar with the ABAP stack more so than the Java stack. This movement of uh, migration of 10.1 to the ABAP stack um, really does simplify things for a lot of organizations. So, uh, you know, I, I've worked with customers of mine who they're requesting troubleshooting access from their, or troubleshooting time from their basis team. And uh, the basis team's subconsciously prioritizing those to the end because they know that it's going to be a little more complex and difficult to, to troubleshoot. It's not your standard ABAP tools. Now you've got, with the porting of 10.1 back to ABAP, you've got, um, you know, your standard troubleshooting tools for, you know, performance tuning and database management and, and backups. Um, your backup strategy. So it, it is a little simpler uh, for your basis team to support. And then from a security perspective, a lot of you on the call, my guess is, are primarily security folks. Um, you've got your sec more granular security model that you're familiar with, you know, uh, S01, PFCG, uh, to manage the, the users and roles. And then um, you know, your troubleshooting tools, or, you know, the SU-53, et cetera, to, to maintain that. And, and the security really is a lot more granular. You can actually grant access to the report level uh, where you couldn't do that in 5.3. And then finally, one other key area where there's been a lot of time focused on 
on improvements is, is EAM, so they've uh, or firefighter. They've centralized that, um, so as opposed to executing a T code in the uh, source system, which you can still do. You have the option the option to follow a very similar workflow to access request management. Um, you can request firefighter within the GRC instance. Um, and, and, and request the specific system that you need that access for. You can actually do that if you so desire without passwords. So you can, if it, since it's just a request, you're not making data changes, um, you can theoretically just hop on as your username, request that access, trigger the workflow for the, for the approvals. So it's a lot more streamlined. There's also, uh, again, going back to the reporting, the firefighter reporting, they've spent a lot of time thinking through this and making it simpler. A couple of key areas. One is they've combined um, a lot of the activity usage with some of the follow-up investigations that you would do, the data that you would, uh, might look at. So for example, if someone's going to run FK02 um, in 5.3, you're going to know they made that change. You might want to go investigate your vendor change docs to see what was actually changed. Um, in 10.1, you've got change docs that are incorporated into the consolidated EAM log. So that investigation is right in the report that you generate to review your firefighter activity. Um, it also combines other things like OS command history. So you've got a pretty rich set of logging detail that you can go in and, and evaluate. Um, so this next slide is an example of that. It actually shows a sample uh, consolidated log report. This is actually kind of suspicious. Uh, you, we see someone's uh, executed a payment run. <laughs> uh, this is just a demo, so hopefully this doesn't happen to you guys that often. They've executed a payment run and then gone and changed a vendor, then entered an invoice or executed F-02, which is a create financial document, and then they've rolled a period. But they actually haven't done anything with those transactions. They might just be viewing. You don't see any change docs associated with it. Where the real risk is here is they, in this particular case, ran SU-01. When they did that, you can see the change docs that um, user types were modified, a new user was created, et cetera. So you have that information to say whether or not this is something that's really worth investigating or it's a non-issue because no changes were made. So they've spent a lot of time there. They've also, um, you also have the capability now, which is also a big one for a lot of customers to do separation duties reporting on firefighter requests. So this, cat, this really helps you address a key risk area that wasn't addressed with 5.3. Uh, you might request the access, and the access might be approved, but the person approving the access is making their best a judgment call as to whether or not there's a separation duties issue uh, with the access requested. Well, once that access request is completed, you can do a separation duties issue uh, report on activity and then potentially use that to guide any further investigations on activity once the request is complete. So again, just a lot of wins here. Um, from, a, from a user experience and reporting perspective. I think I've talked about this as much as I can. <laughs> so uh, again, in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and jump to landscape recommendations. When we're, customers are talking about migrating, and it is a migration to 10.1. Again, we're talking about 5.3 being on the Java stack, 10.1 Java, or ABAP. Uh, there is no upgrade path. It is a migration. So as you're migrating, there's uh, a lot of risks that customers are concerned about. Um, so one I've run into a lot, compliance reporting. My auditors are used to looking at this report. If I spin up 10.1, what concerns is that going to cause with them? Again, auditors are trained to key, they key in on the differences. Um, you don't want them to start uh, you know, start on a mole hunt for uh, when, when their reporting formats change in 10.1. So how can, how can you address that? How can you um, migrate your users? So you've got in-flight access or CUP requests on your 5.3 system, and then you're wanting to migrate your users to ARM. How can you cut over to that so that you're, you can fulfill your requests, get users requesting new act, okay, fulfill your requests in the old system, have users request access in the new system, and sort of have those two run in parallel while you're um, migrating to 
key risk for a lot of users. Um, sign off for your master data, so your, your risk owners, your role owners, your approvers, all those types of things. Um, if I'm generating a report on uh, role approvals from 5.3 and I'm generating the same report in 10, is compliance going to be questioning that report? you know, in terms of are these approvals, are these the correct approvers, et cetera. Um, and then finally, uh, the rule set. And that's actually a key one for a lot of organizations. Um, a lot of internal audit folks are going to question your separation of duties reports if, if they think that there's not continuity between what they signed off on in 5.3 and what's in 10. So how can you address these? Uh, a lot of these can be handled with your, with your landscape design. So I'm going to go ahead and throw up a, a typical three-tier or an example three-tier landscape. Um, you guys might have a two-tier landscape. Um, that's fine. Hopefully no one has a one-tier <laughs> uh, GRC landscape. So this is kind of represents, you know, you've got ECC, CRM, maybe some other ancillary systems that are child systems uh, or that are managed by your GRC 5.3 system. And so as you're focused on migrating, um, the the option that we'd recommend is, is basically ha set up a parallel stack, and there's a couple of really good reasons to do this. Um, you can uh, potentially reprovision your GRC 5.3 hardware. It, it gets tricky, um, especially when you're talking about the risks that we just talked about. You know, how do you uh, handle in-flight cup requests, et cetera. Um, to re and then the second example, or the second reason that you'd want to stand up this parallel environment is a lot of your um, sizing requirements for 5.3 are different than, than 10. So you could potentially repurpose your hardware. You need to throw more memory and disk, uh, potentially add it, maybe throw in some more cores. Um, but your, your, the SAPs that are required for a 5.3 system are, are less than the, SA, the SAPs that are required for a 10.1 system, the equivalent 10.1 system. So you're going to want to provision new hardware just to handle the, the additional um, SAPs that are required for 10. But in this example, we've got our 10.1 uh, our parallel environment set up, and we're getting ready to migrate. Um, you, you'll notice that there's a couple of boxes, uh, smaller boxes in our ECC dev and QA systems that look different. They're slightly lighter colored than the other ones. Those are our, our plugins, our GRC plugins. Uh, so this is a, I'm looking at the plugin specifically. That's the GRC pin W um, add-on that you've installed previously to get 5.3 functioning. Um, you, you most likely won't be able to run 10.1 in parallel with 5.3 with the plugins that you have, but with a little planning, you can absolutely have both systems running in parallel. So um, the access control 10.1 is compatible, backwards compatible with the 7.0, 7.1.0, 7.2.0, etc. plugins. Um, on certain specific versions of those plugins, so with by upgrading, you can potentially, or you should be able to get to a situation where your 5.3 system and your 10.1 system are compatible with the plugins in your child systems. There's a couple of key notes on this. Um, if you want to write these down or screenshot this slide, and again, as Jennifer said, we can send this out to you if you'd so like. Um, 1590030 uh, talks about coexistence of the plugins with these three different systems. And yes, you can actually, if you wanted to, run GRC 10, 10, 1, and 5.3 in parallel, all three of those. Hopefully you don't decide to do that. It is a little more complex. Um, the other note, 1680268, deals with the backwards compatibility of Access Control 10, 1 with uh, the plugin versions. So both of those notes should help you plan um, your plug-in versions in your landscape accordingly. So moving back to our landscape diagram, here we see that we've now provisioned access through to our productive environment. Um, there are different colors here. The, the dark green in the background means that GRC 5.3 is still my productive system. Um, access control, the, my access control 10.1 landscape is still my um, standby system. But at some point, you're going to be able to make that decision to cut over um, and make your Access Control 10.1 landscape 
productive. Um, and here's that scenario. Um, again, most likely if you're using CUP in 5.3, you're going to have requests that are going to be required to close out, closed out in 5.3. Um, so you can still enter, you know, pr uh, have approvers access 5.3 to do approvals. Uh, I probably want to spend a little bit of time training them on the difference between the two environments because they'll be theoretically approving in both systems. Um, once these are finally closed out in 5.3, um, then you can fully be migrated over to Access Control 10.1. And then your, your mid to long term landscape here uh, basically shows that 5.3 system still in place. Um, again, very good reason to have that there. Um, so if you're, as you're migrating, and we'll talk about data migration next, you absolutely have the ability to migrate transactional data from your GRC 5.3 system. The challenge is you cannot import that into 10.1. So if you have uh, an internal audit or a compliance department that's asking you questions like, hey, can you show me activity for this firefighter ID from a year ago today, uh, you're going to want to keep that GRC 5.3 system around. And you're also going to want to have um, buy-in from your internal audit or compliance department on when that system can be deprovisioned. De and then once you have that buy-in, you can make a commitment on to, to supporting that system through that date and can decommission it afterwards. So that's, uh, that's a little bit about landscape planning. Again, the parallel landscape strongly recommended. You can do um, reprovision hardware. It, it just increases your risk significantly of having a, a, you know, a problem as you're going through your migration. So let's m move on to our next section, which is migrating master data. And I should just say migrating data. Um, there's a kind of a discussion around what's con master data and what's configuration, especially when it comes to GRC. I think that is going to that definition is going to change over time. I don't think there's a lot that's truly considered uh, configuration at this point, and there's some things that probably should be that aren't, uh, that will be in the future, um, rule sets come to mind. So migrating data. Um, there is a migration guide out there. There's a link to this on the next slide. Kind of walks through the process. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty complete. You want to definitely follow the migration guide as you go through this. The basic process is uh, you will have prerequisites on the 5.3 side that you need to complete. You can export your firefighter data after that, and then you can export the data, your config master and transactional data from your other modules in that third step. Once that's complete, um, you can do your common config and access control, your 10.1 system. Then there's some intermigration tasks you need to complete. Import your data and complete your post-import tasks. Um, a lot of these are uh, basically configuration steps for new concepts that don't really exist in 5.3, like connector groups. Those types of things are completed after you migrate that data in, and then you go through a val data validation step at the end. Now, getting into the details of what's being migrated, um, in common configuration data, so a lot of your settings, like, you know, um, is, is, is a risk analysis required to provision access? Um, those types of configuration settings are going to be migrated across. Um, you're also going to have your rule sets, um, your mitigating controls now, which you did not have, and that should be mitigating, I apologize. Mitigating controls migrated across, that was not an option in 2012 when 10.0 first came out, so good for you for waiting. <laughs> um, that's, there's one good reason, they've, they've, they've uh, supported additional types of data that can be migrated across. Your org rules. Um, if you have those, uh, not a lot of customers do, but if you do have those, those can mi be migrated across. Also, your, uh, your business role management or ERM repository data, if you're using ERM, or uh, yeah, if you're using ERM, that'll uh, be, if that's uh, importable into your 10.1 system, and also CUP and Firefighter. Um, you want to migrate all of these types of data using this GRAC data migration transaction in your GRC 10.1 system. And again, here's the, the link to get to that uh, install guide around uh, mi the migration guide. Uh, your, all your migration install um, 
overview docs are going to be located here in your Inst Guides hot link, and then you're going to want to navigate to uh, the Access Control Release 10.1 section. So that seems, you know, fairly straightforward. Uh, These next few slides are just focused on kind of lessons learned. What isn't the guide telling you? Um, so the first thing is, uh, we I was kind of being pedantic about what's transportable config and what's not. Um, and there's a reason for that, because the guide is going to walk you through getting your dev system prepped, but there, it, most of your post-import tasks are considered transportable config, so connector groups, connector uh, additions, et cetera. Those are going to be transported across through to QA. So while the guide gets you your dev system set up, it doesn't really help you get a grasp for what's, what it takes to get those, that data and that configuration migrated through to production. And this basically walks through, uh, this slide basically walks through the steps that you need to do. Um, so for step one and two, it's, you know, you basically are following the guide. Uh, it's a, the guide does recommend validating the data. So step three, you're following the guide. Step four is part of the guide. Step five, your post-import tasks. Um, at this point, when you're in QA, this is transportable config. So you're going to want to uh, import your transports from dev to Q and then perform your data validation at that point. Uh, you may have some additional steps that need to be configured or some data that didn't get transported across. This is your chance to get production right if you're running that three-tier landscape. If you're not running a three-tier and you're running a two-tier, you're going to have to just fix production. <laughs> um, but at least you uh, can take comfort knowing that this access control 10.1 production environment isn't actually in production yet. So this is the basic process that you're going to follow to get your config and your master data from 5.3 through and consistent through to your productive environment. Um, another issue that a lot of customers have questions around is rule sets. So a lot of customers, when they implemented 5.3, they've got the SAP recommended rule set. Um, they may have tweaked that a little bit. And, and typically how that works is, you know, uh, you're saying, hey, I've got a high risk here around materials management. Someone did a goods receipt and did a goods movement. Uh, and, and, you know, the, these, this rule set isn't one size fits all. So some organizations, you know, their material management risk is significantly less. So for example, a water plant or a utility, um, you know, they're not really dealing with um, you know, they're not, they're not dealing with uh, cash or, uh, bad example, or iPhones, iPads, uh, kind of high value goods that can potentially disappear from inventory. Um, so, you know, you may have had a controller that says, this isn't really a high risk for us. Let's go ahead and make this a medium risk or a low risk for our organization. So you may have made those changes in your 5.3 system over time, um, and that pretty much hopefully is a reflection of your risk level within your organization. Well, you're going to be activating a 10-1 rule set, which is basically going to be current up through 2012. And then you potentially have uh, an opportunity to combine some new rule set updates if you haven't done them already. Um, every year, basically, SAP is releasing rule set updates. Um, they basically capture um, typically at the permission level, some separation of duties issues that, some gaps that hadn't been, weren't in the previous rule set. Um, so you've got an opportunity to take these and, 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 and decide what you want to do with them. Do we want to take our custom rule set and, and take the updates and combine them into one? Um, do we want to combine all three? How can we do this? So there are three basic strategies for merging these, uh, if that's the route you decide to go down. Um, you can do them manually. These uh, aren't massive rule set updates. Um, you can mer do them manually in 10.1 or do them in 5.3 and then export them. Uh, if there are a lot of changes, uh, in, and we're talking in the hundreds of lines, um, then you also have the option to just export them, modify the CSV files manually um, to merge that data in, and then import that into 10.1. And, uh, there's an excellent blog on this basic process written by a colleague of mine that I've worked with, uh, Jonathan Priest. Uh, so I wanted to point you to that. It, that's uh, one of the something you're interested in doing, merging your rule sets. 
Um, there's also a couple of notes here that I wanted to reference that with the rule set updates, if you have not applied them, um, you can go out and find them. Again, 2014 rule sets aren't out yet. I did check on this earlier this week. They could theoretically be out today. My guess is they'll be out in Q, in the, towards the end of Q1, Q2, or beginning of Q2. And finally, a lot of customers have questions around workflow. The workflow concept um, in between 5.3 and 10 has changed significantly. And again, this is kind of a value add using um, multi-stage, multi-path workflows, um, BRF plus to initiate. Um, you know, st standard things that if you have people in your organization who are familiar with SAP workflow, they can maintain and uh, enhance what you've got easily with the skill sets they already have. Um, the, the process for workflow migration is a little different uh, than it is for the other master data. You do export it as, as uh, per the guide. Um, there is a different transaction to import that data into uh, production. And you're going to want to basically import it into a, a one of the existing workflows. And, and the SP delivered workflows are very, um, the out of the box workflows are focused on uh, what most customers need, which is, you know, you know, change user, new user, um, request firefighter access, et cetera. There's some standardized workflows that are delivered with 10.1. Um, you would want to overwrite those with uh, the, the appropriate uh, workflows with what you've customized in 5.3. Um, and again, those SAP delivered workflows are available if needed. One caveat, um, a lot of the initiators uh, so what the things that are kicking off uh, triggering your workflows if they're based on uh, HR triggers. So we want to kick off a change request based on a position change in HR. Um, those tend to have problems and you need to spend some additional time reconfiguring uh, your initiators uh, in that scenario uh, to get those HR based workflows working. So some lessons learned. We've talked through some of the lessons learned that uh, we've come across as we've done migrations. I, I wanted to spend this last section talking about the business case, just at a high level. Uh, I want to get you know give you the key benefits to migrating, and then give you an idea of kind of effort and time required to get this done. So we've talked. You know, some of these benefits may seem repetitive. You know, we talked about feature enhancements. Um, that does tie into uh, a lot of these into your business case, right? If you can streamline your access request process, you can, uh, if your reports are more actionable, those are definitely things that need to be considered in your business case. Um, but the biggest one, of course, is there's no need to purchase extended support for 5.3 um, if you do want to do that. Um, I just wanted to throw out there, I know customers now who are entering SAP notes for GRC 5.3 issues, and they are being told this is fixed in 10.1, migrate to 10.1. So in really, de facto support has ended for 5.3. Um, if you do run into issues from here to December, it's going to be difficult for you to convince them to provide you a fix for 5.3. Uh, in some cases, you're not going to be able to do that. Again, uh, centralized emergency access management, um, that simplifies end user support. It also simplifies uh, reporting. Uh, so you've got central reports, um, and those reports are a little more granular as well for your internal auditors. So that's a key value add for a lot of customers. Uh, mobile device support, another key benefit that you don't get. I mean, you don't have the Fiori, uh, with the announcement that Fiori is now free. Um, there are Fiori applications that are available for GRC. Uh, they are not available for GRC 5.3. They are um, available for 10, 10, 1 customers. Um, so if you want to be able to do approvals and requests on mobile devices, you've got that now capability now with 10, 1. Um, again, audit compliance is significantly easier. We talked through that um, with the reports, you know, reports being enhanced to add actionable data into those reports. Um, you've also got improved organizational flexibility. So again, as you're wanting to further automate processes around access request management, business role management, you've got that 
integration, that tight integration with IDM and some of the other GRC suite applications. And finally, of course, I just threw this out there. It's, a, it's technically an ARM simplification, but you do have password reset management. For some customers, this is a, a value add. I mean, they have password reset solutions out there, but they don't support SAP. Uh, and again, you're talking about the time it takes for a user to enter a ticket, the time it takes for the help desk to reset that password, and then lost productivity in the, in the interim. Um, you can, you know, usually set a pretty clear dollar amount to, to that opportunity cost and the time it takes for your IT support staff to support that user. And uh, you can gain a lot of, of time back by implementing that password reset feature. So I wanted to let you know that's out there and available with 10.1. Um, just high level. Um, what, what you can expect to migrate to 10.1, again, we're assuming that you're doing that parallel landscape scenario we talked about earlier. Uh, we're looking at a couple weeks of basis time to stand up your new landscape. Uh, four to six weeks of configuration time for access control, um, which is including in your business requirements gathering, which should be the same uh, between the two. Um, data migration uh, from the 5.3 and then the final you know, post-installation configuration and validation. Um, you're going to you know, want to plan about a month, month and a half to do that. Um, again, you're going to have additional time that you want to plan for change control. Everyone's change control processes are different. Some are more robust than others, and things take longer with certain change control processes. You're going to want to account for that. Um, you're going to want to spend the time with internal audit to give them to make them comfortable with uh, the reports, with the master data. Um, that, that is in the 10.1 system. Having both systems in parallel, by the way, really helps that. Having me, maybe there's a reporting period or two that you're generating reports out of both systems. Um, and they can see the new report formats, and they can also, um, you know, do the, do the comparison between the two. And then you're also going to want to spend some time potentially training users, um, and, you know, support staff, as well as, as your end users entering access requests. and uh, emergency access management requests. And finally, if you do want mobile device support, there's going to be additional time spent to configure that. So hopefully that gives you the, the benefits of upgrading. Hopefully it gives you the uh, a feeling for what it takes to get that upgrade done. And uh, that pretty much wraps up the the, the slides that we have, the presentation that we have today, and I uh, wanted to reserve this for remainder of this time for questions. And there's a, it's a good news, bad news scenario. <laughs> We're probably going to get all our questions answered today. <laughs> we only have the one question. So if you do have any questions specific to your environment or specific to any concerns that you have migrating to 5.3, please go ahead, or migrating to 10.1, please uh, go ahead and enter those now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Jennifer at this point. Jennifer. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for the very helpful information. If anyone's interested in receiving additional information, um, click on the Raise My Hand button in the control panel, and we'll be sure to reach out to you directly. Or you can contact Gary directly. His contact information is shown on this slide here. Um, we will now move on to the Q&A. Um, had a couple, another question come in. So first question here is from Nordin. Is GRC 10.1 compatible with NW 7.4? All right, and this is Gary. Uh, thanks again, Jennifer. Uh, so is it compatible? Yes, it is definitely compatible. And the, the NetWeaver, the, the GRC 10W, in, in fact, okay, so the host uh, NetWeaver OS, or the host NetWeaver version needs to be 7.4 for the access control system. In terms of, of child systems or systems that are being managed or monitored with uh, access control 10.1, um, there is a 7.4 plugin that's available and actually gives you additional functionality. Um, so you definitely have that capability. Again, not everyone has upgraded their <laughs> Um, Solution Manager and ECC and other systems to NetWeaver 7.4. Um, this, this is especially problematic in an ECC landscape, correct? So 
there's definitely support for 7.4 from both the plugin perspective and from the GRC foundation perspective in your GRC landscape. All right, next question is from Michelle. Uh, we're in the process of 10.1 upgrade, NWBC, and I apologize um, with the <laughs> acronyms, is very slow. Any ideas on how to improve performance? All right, so, so great question, Michelle. Uh, the SAP GUI client is uh, pretty thin. I think it's been it's a, one of the value adds of SAP. Um, you can, you know, have remote users and remote, multiple users in remote locations with very slow networks that are able to perform um, at a tolerable level within the SAP GUI. You're talking looking at like 8K per session. The NetWeaver business client is a little fatter. It's also HTTP based. Um, I don't know your specific solution. Um, you're going to probably want to spend time on um, uh, where, where I would focus is in the troubleshooting component of that. So um, if you are dealing with a long fat area network, so basically a big pipe to a remote location that's got high latency, you know, 100 milliseconds plus, this sounds like the scenario that you're talking about. Um, you're going to want to spend some time on troubleshooting that. So uh, any any sort of signal quality issues on that line, again, I'm getting into the weeds here, um, but any sort of signal quality issues are going to be causing retransmits, which will definitely have an impact uh, on, on a NetWeaver business client, more so than an, on the GUI. Um, again, you're talking about when, when at any time that there's a there's a error in your packet transmission, your window size is reset to 1. And so you're talking about exchanging like 1.5K at a time, and that can really slow things down. So I'd spend some time with your networking team troubleshooting quality on that. Um, there's potentially some TCP IP optimization you can do depending on your client OS level. So if it's a Windows OS, there are tuning, there is tuning that you can do on the client side, um, basically to set your initial window size to higher than one. Um, so not, it's not, so I'm get, again, getting into the weeds here, but there are a lot of options available to you. I would spend my initial time on the network side and then on perform, uh, doing some performance tuning on the TCP IP stack uh, on the client side. All right, um, from Niranjan, next question. Is mobile support available for GRC 10? Okay, and this is Gary again. I'm trying to actually read the question. Is mobile support available for GRC 10 too? Yes, it is, definitely. So t I assume the question is, and this is Niranjan, um, is it, do we have support for uh, Fury with 10 and 10.1? The answer is yes. Yes, you do. Um, I, if you have some follow-up questions, uh, specific to your environment, please feel free to ask them. We might want to take that one offline because uh, we're getting into version discussions at this point. Um, but you can definitely run Fiori applications in your GRC 10.0 environment. All right, um, next question from Alexander. Does the licensing mod module change with 10.1? We only have license for RER uh, 5.3 and not other modules. So good question. Uh, the licensing model does change, uh, and it may change. It may have already changed again. So there's a, a currently there is um, a light version, ex, an Express GRC Express, and it is licensed as GRC Express, not Access Control Express. Um, that basically covers RER. And then there is another one that covers the remaining modules. I believe, though, the Express version also covers Firefighter. So the Express version covers Fire or EAM and ARA. And then the full version is going to cover uh, the other two modules. The, that said, uh, you'll have they, they will, you'll have uh, support for your old license type. So you can absolutely, with your existing license, upgrade to 10.1, only run ARA now, uh, but you can, I guess you can call it 
RAR if you'd like. <laughs> Only run ARA and, and still be in compliant with your old license. They'll definitely have, um, they'll definitely honor your previous license agreement in 10.1. Uh, that said, I would still encourage you to have that discussion with your uh, account executive. Um, you know, they, they may have some additional um, points to make there, but you should have that. Um, they should honor your existing license um, in 10.1. Perfect. Thanks, Gary. Uh, next question from Mamie. We currently have a two-tier environment, development and production. What are the some, some of the issues with keeping the same mod model with 10.1? Can, am I on? I, I'm trying to apologize. I want to make sure I'm not muted. Um, okay, so thank you, Mamie. Good question. Uh, you know, the biggest benefit that you get from having a three-tier environment, in my mind, um, is is basically you get a, a two chances to get your data loads right. So if you think back to your original SAP implementation, you probably went through three iterations of master data loads, um, you know, mock cutovers, uh, maybe two or three, I'm not sure. Um, but if you want to spend a significant amount of time getting those data loads correct and doing your data validation. Um, you've got two chances to do that in a three-tier. You've got one chance to do that in a one-tier. Um, Apart from that, uh, you know, I think those you know, having a two-tier environment is workable. The challenge, you know, of course, there, you may have compliance challenges like in the FDA validated environment, you're going to want a three-tier, your FDA folks are always going to want a three-tier landscape. Um, that may not be applicable, it sounds like it's not applicable to you if you don't have that now. Um, so the one caveat I'd have is it, 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 there's a little more risk because you're migrating your data directly into production. But apart from that, it should be uh, a workable uh, landscape for you. Perfect. Um, this question is from John. Can GRC 10.1 run on HANA? All right. It, thanks, John. And the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, no, they definitely uh, have uh, GRC, uh, HANA support for GRC. Um, where might you consider that, uh, you know, what scenarios might that be beneficial to you? Um, the biggest one I can see is if you have heavily customized your rule set um, and you're combining multiple functions and your rule set generations are taking an inordinate amount of time, um, that's when you can get a huge win from, from running HANA. Another Okay, thank you. Another scenario might be if you're doing a lot of cross-system risk detection, those cross-system risks, uh, the amount of time it takes to generate those rules is a lot higher, especially as you go from uh, two to nine systems. You, your rule set isn't, uh, you know, tw say nine, you know, nine times bigger. It's actually, uh, you know, geomet there's a geometric relationship there, so it's nine to the uh, nine squared times uh, higher. So you basically could have a rule set that's 81 times larger than you have today in that scenario. Um, so if, if you have a, a fairly complex rule set and, and your rule set generation is taking a long time, that might be an option or uh, there might be an opportunity for you to get some significant performance gains in HANA. That said, with 10.1, you know, I, I think the reporting's a lot snappier. Um, you know, I'm running, you know, I've got customers running ARA reports, and there's no need to run that interim, you know, risk calculation and then reports on the risks. Um, you can run the, your reports directly from your user data, your repository data, um, and that's, you know, that's not an a onerous process. You're talking, you know, 15, 20 minutes for kind of a mid-market client. Um, if those, if you have a really large installation and those are taking hours and hours, that's another potential uh, benefit of migrating to HANA. But if you don't have the need to migrate to HANA today, um, or you don't have real significant performance issues in your 5.3 landscape, uh, you, you'd probably be hard pressed to build a business case to migrate to HANA uh, with your access, in your access control 10.1 environment. Perfect. 
Perfect. Um, next question is from Raymond. Since GRC 5.3 is based on Java stack, how does or will this affect sizing for GRC 10.1 on the ABAP stack? All right. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, how does this affect sizing? I would say, um, generally speaking, I tried to address this earlier, uh, generally speaking, your, the SAPs that are required for your 10.1 system is going to be higher. Your SAPs requirements are going to be higher than they were for 5.3. Um, I do think that 10 is a little more scalable, so if you, I don't imagine you've got a really large installation with multiple app servers involved. Um, as you know, there's problems addressing um, uh, high amounts of memory in, in your Java stack, so you might have more application servers than you would with, with 10.1. Um, so you may actually be able to, to, if you have a very large installation, run on fewer app servers. Um, that said, your overall SAPS requirement is going to be higher uh, for your 10.1 system. So I hope that addresses your question. If I didn't, you know, uh, please feel free to follow up that question with another one. Great. We have two questions left. Um, first one's from Harry. Do you consider it mandatory to update rule set with annual notes or updates for 2012, 2013, and 2014? Okay. Okay, so uh, thanks. Good question, Harry. Um, if I were your internal audit or external audit partner, I could definitively answer that. Um, I think that if they knew that those uh, those rule set updates were out there, they would probably um, raise the question themselves. Um, is it absolutely mandatory? It depends on your scope. I do know that they do a better. They're, they're basically. Uh, they're going to catch a lot of false negatives. They're going to catch some new risks that you may not have been aware of, depending on what transactions are in scope for and what business processes are in scope for your specific install. Um, so a good idea to imp, install those. Um, I wouldn't go as far as saying it's mandatory. Um, you're going to want to work with your internal audit and external audit firms to make that call. Again, hopefully that answers your question. If you have any follow-ups, you know, please feel free to ask. All right, last question from Alexander. Do we have to merge the rule set, or can we just use the one we already have without making changes? All right. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, good question. Can you merge? Yes. Uh, you, you, oh, no, you do not have to merge the rule set. Um, we did address the issue. You can merge them, but you can absolutely, you have the option with all of your master data imports to overwrite or append. And in the case, if you want to just, if you've got a rule set that's been blessed by internal audit and that's what you're comfortable with, you can absolutely overwrite uh, when you import that data in and basically go live with the 5.3 rule set that you have today. Last question. I'm not sure if you answered this one, but it was an additional one from John. Um, query reporting performance. I think this was related to HANA. Oh. Oh, so, okay. So, um, so John followed up his previous question with, okay, you know, is it HANA, is it, can, does it, is it supported? And he's wanting to know if query performing report it, performance is, is better. And of course it is. It's, it's, it's a m orders of magnitude better. Um, where you might, again, I think I've touched on the key areas where you might see some performance gains. Um, I've got a customer, again, who can run an SOD report in 15 minutes. Um, with on HANA, that report would probably take a second to do. It would be more or less real time. Um, of course, can you build a business case for HANA? That depends on the organization. And in, in this particular case, that customer could not make a business case on, on, you know, being able to run a separation duties report in 15 minutes versus one minute. It's a, that's a quarterly control for them, and, and they can afford to wait an extra 15 minutes. Great. Well, that just about concludes our webinar. Um, thanks, Gary, for your time today and great information, and thank you for everyone for joining. Uh, if you could, please complete the survey at the conclusion of our webinar here. Um, it will help us ensure that we are providing you with the right content and would love to hear any suggestions for additional topics. Bye everyone and have a great day.
Thanks, everyone.